Good evening, everyone. I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Shmuel, for inviting me. Uh, since most of you, or basically all of you, are already what we call from Jews, at least that's what we think we are, uh, what from Jews need? To stay from. And today, uh, some kind of an epidemic that most of the Jews that are from, instead of going higher, they're going lower. Everywhere you go. Not only in Flatbush or in different parts of America. It's also in Eretz Israel. It's in Europe like that. And uh, when we find that most of the people who are supposed to actually elevate themselves every year more and more and more, actually they're going lower and lower, so we have to find where the problem is. We have to hit the root of the problem. What is, the, what is really the problem that caused so many people to become more and more goish and to behave like the goyim and to dress like them and to talk like them and to conduct business like them and the marriages in our community also became like them and there's a lot of uh, things that, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, nobody dreamed that it will ever enter our community. And now it's already uh, basically every day. Everyone got used to it already. One of the worst problems is that we get used to our horrible situation that it stopped bothering us. Then you know that we are actually lost the battle. As long as a, as a patient He's fighting for his life, there's a chance that he'll get saved. But once he gives up, everyone knows that from here the, to the complete destruction, the, the road is very short. It gets to a point that finally when someone stands on a stage and says what needs to be done, what Hashem is actually expecting us to do, many people get upset at him for saying the truth. And uh, the fact that you all came to hear from a speaker like me that is, has a reputation of a very strict speaker, and many people complain about the way I speak. They say, speak too hard, you have to speak more you know, pleasant, and the people will enjoy the lectures. So for me, it's an indication that you are searching what's, you know, how to elevate your situation, how to make things better. So therefore, I will give you, hopefully, a lecture that will be productive, that when you go home you have something to think about, and maybe a good advice how to improve ourselves. One thing to make it clear, I'm not coming to preach to you like I'm perfect and you need my advice. We, I speak to all of us basically together. Some needs it more, some needs it less. It definitely cannot make a damage. Uh, we find today that the more technology is developing, the more problems we have in our Jewish life. It has to be a direct connection to it. It cannot be a coincidence that the more advanced the world becomes, technology-wise, the more suffering the Jewish community suffers. So the question is, what's really happening here? In the old days, it was very difficult to make a scene. It was very difficult. Uh, people always made scenes from day one. From time of Adam until now, basically every generation, people made sins. But it was much, much harder to make sins than today. It was harder to, to see things on the streets that we see today. It was harder to basically merge and mix with the, with the goyim. There was a big wall between us and them. We used to look very different. We used to dress very different than them. We find in a, in a Megillah, soon we entering Purim, remember this when, when you read the Megillah, that Haman came to Achashverosh, he built this case based on the fact that the Jews are strange. They look strange, they dress strange, they speak different, they have a different religion. You can detect, you can detect a Jew right away. There's no question what are you, a Jew or a Goy. They, everyone knew in the time of Haman, 127 countries that were controlled by Ahasuerus, that you, you have no mistake between a Jew or a non-Jew. Everyone knows the Jews are different, they're strange, they don't want to be a part of the community. Prior to that, 
when we went to Eretz Mitzrayim, first thing Yosef said to his family, say that you shepherds, they'll look at you down, they will, you know, you're going to become a second, second class citizen, they don't want to be with you, this, this Egyptian goyim, they are an empire advanced, they would actually vomit you from their community and they give you some kind of a ghetto. What is it? Eretz Goshen. You'll be isolated. It's good for them, but it's mainly good for us. We don't care about them. We care about us. So it will be very good for us. So as long as the Jews lived in Goshen, everything worked out beautiful. Right when the Torah say, Umala Eretz Otam, they started to move into all the neighborhoods of the Goyim. They started to succeed because there is a decree that the Jews will always succeed more than the Goyim, percentage-wise, statistically. For every hundred people in the world, you take hundred Gentiles, all of them went to good universities, and then you take a hundred Jews who went to the same universities, always, no matter when, in what generation, the Jews will always be more successful. They will be wealthier, they'll be smarter, they'll have better position, they will be influential more than the Goyim. Why? Because God says so. It's in the Torah. At the same time, the Torah already said that they will never love us. No matter what we're going to do, there, will, there was always going to be some kind of a wall between us and them. Which is very good, because if there was no wall, today we, we wouldn't have one Jew left. The only reason you still have 13.2 Jew, million Jews left in the world should have been about 5 billion, if you consider the fact that we started in the same generation like, uh, like the Chinese, right? The grandson of Noah is the Chinese, and Shem is the son of Noah, so we basically were the uncle of China. And China is close to 2 billion people, and we are a drop, like uh, nothing compared to them. To, to them alone, forget the rest of the world. There is 7 billion people, 80,000 people in the world. 7 billion, 80,000. And uh, from the 7 billion, we are not even 1% of 1% of the population in the world. But it seems that everywhere you go, nobody speaks about any other nation more than they speak about us. In, in all the important countries in the world, the countries that design design uh, fi finance and culture and... Uh, and uh, army and power and democracy and freedom and all these uh, terms that we like to use, it seems that every country you go, the Jews are in the top of the pyramid, as the Torah promised. Rashi said, Mashal means a parable. Everyone, you will be the highlight. A parable is something that you compare something else to it. It's always the, the center, and then you can give many uh, comparison examples from this parable. Uh, Shnina who comes from the word Shanun. Shanun means in Hebrew, Chad, sharp. You're always going to be the sharpest. You're going to be the, the pioneers. You're more advanced. It's needless to say that even in this country, there are more uh, Jewish doctors than non-Jewish doctors when the Jews are only 2% of the community in America. Same thing, lawyers and judges, same thing in many other countries that you go. Also, as far as Nobel Prize winners, the Jews are the leaders by far. Also, we, should, we already also see that almost all the technology that we have today, it's all invented in Israel by Jewish minds. Everything, all these iPhones, Apple, uh, uh, Intel, all these big companies, it's needless to say that the first place they build big factories, it's in Israel. And they have big factories all over Israel because they know the best brains in the world is where the Jews live. The Goyim do not deny it. I deal with them. I get emails from them all over the world. The problem that we have, it's a religion issue. But as far as that the Jews are very successful and, and sharp and the rest of the things, they're not denying it. They know it. Sometimes that's the reason why we suffer so much from antisemitism and all kinds of other things. But the question is, because of this success and all the things that supposedly we have and the materialism and the lifestyle that we live in and the freedom that we have, especially here in America, we are now in New York, we live, uh, basically we are free, we have rights, equal rights, nobody tells you you cannot get it because you are a Jew. Many, many places in history Jews could not come out of their door. They always had to put customs if they wanted or they had to change their names or to hide, like in communist Russia. 
you couldn't play, practice Judaism, you couldn't circumcise the babies, definitely certain things we couldn't do. And we're talking only two, three generations ago. Um, now I have to go, for instance, to Turkey. Just a year ago, Turkey was a very good friend of Israel. Supposedly, it's all nonsense, it's all politic. Uh, but I have to go to Turkey. Everyone who here I go to Turkey get panic. Wow, I cannot go there with the yarmulke. I have to get a baseball hat. Maybe it's better you cancel, you shouldn't go. Jews cannot go everywhere. There's countries you cannot even, there's, in Saudi Arabia, you cannot enter. You cannot enter. If you have an Israeli passport, you can enter. Not only that, the, the Saudi airline don't let Jews on their airlines. They're not, high, they're, not, they're not afraid of anyone. You have the money. The United States will bow down to them. There's nothing they can do. It can only affect countries who need help from the United States. Once you have Saudi with all the trillions, you can't tell them what to do. They decide Jews are not welcome. There's no entry for them. But now, no matter how bad it is, it's nothing compared to how it used to be. And you also, horrible life the Jews had. <laughs> horrible. You couldn't do, you couldn't own businesses, you couldn't own real estate. There's all kinds of things that it was very bad. The question is when life is better for us? When we're free and we're in control and we have full freedom? Or when the Goim remind us who we are and we're different for them and we always have to beg just for them to treat us fairly? and to allow us to basically live. When is it better for us? Not physically, spiritually. If you check in history, it's always better for our spiritual level that we don't have freedom, that we don't have rights. Once we have rights and we're free to do whatever we want, somehow, always, we forget Hashem. And that's the intermarriage is always rising. And in some countries now it's 80%. Even here in America, more Jews marry non-Jews than Jews who marry Jews. And you think it only happens to the secular Jews since anyway they don't know anything about religion. They grew up in public school <coughs> in some places in America that they have no idea what Shabbat is, what, what their Jewish identity is. They have, no, they have no connection. So for them it's obvious to marry anyone they fall in love with. It's nothing to do with Hashem, religion. They don't believe in it anyway. That's true. But you'll be surprised. A large percentage of the intermarriage is people who grew up in yeshivot. They know exactly what intermarriage is. They know. But they went to college with a yarmulke or with a skirt. And something went wrong. And the rest is history. And it happens all the time. The point is like this. Look, the more we will be connected, the more addicted we are to all these things around us. One of the main problems that we have right now is that we have hunger. What is the hunger? We have hunger for comfortable lifestyle. Decoration, design, all kinds of famous brand names, fancy cars, um, nice houses, beautiful stores, fancy vacations, delicious food, lots of maids and comfortable, all kinds of things. And there's only one problem. Yaakov Avinu already said in the Torah something that we never, somehow never got the point. He said to his children, when you come to Pharaoh with all the money that you take to buy merchandise, to buy wheat and barley and whatever you need, make sure that they don't get too much attention to you. That they don't really pay attention to who you are. You come separately, one at a time from different doors. Why? Because if all of them will pay attention that this important fancy Jewish family is coming to Egypt, remember they were very famous from the time of their grandfather, Avraham Avinu. The Torah says Avraham Avinu was the most famous person in the world. The Goim admired him. Besides the fact that he was a very, very wealthy person, he, knew, he was known by the Goim as the, as the messenger of God. The Torah said that the Goim told him when he came to buy Marat HaMachpelah, Ephron was also a very important person, Ephron Achiti. So they told him, you are the representative of God among us. That's what the Goim told him, it's in the Torah. So yeah, Avraham is the grandfather of the Shvatim. You know, they go to Mitzrayim now, so everybody knew who is this Jewish family who comes to buy food because there's hunger everywhere. So Yaakov said to them, don't attract too much attention, which means in our days, in those days, what did they have? Donkeys and lots of cash. 
But in today's, if Yaakov Avinu would have to say what he had to say then, today, he would say, don't go with your Lexus and Mercedes, don't go with your big diamond rings, don't go with your $5,000 outfits, don't attract attention. Come as a very simple person who doesn't attract attention because they go crazy when you shove and wave with your success into their face, especially when the economy is bad. That leads to the next thing. Whenever economy is bad, we are the first one who pays the price for few reasons. One, we are in a banking system, always the head of the Fed, and this, usually it's always Jews. The advisors in economy are all Jewish brains. So when the economy doesn't work, they come to you. Listen, when it was working, you got compliments. When it's not working, you have to pay the price. But that's not the real reason. The real reason is because this is the way Hashem made the world. Hashem made the world that he has his children, and around his children he put wild animals that will always remind them that if you're not going to do what I want, the wild animals will come to attack you. In the old days it was the lions and the bears, and today there's different kinds of things, but it was always the case, always the case. Whenever we are making Hashem upset, another pogrom is on the way. And when we go too far, then there's a holocaust and six millions are dying. And then throughout the history, no nation has suffered more attacks than us. No, no nation. There's nothing even to compare. We think it's very bad. We are asking why Hashem is doing it to us. But really the reason why Hashem is doing it to us is to help us and to save us. One more reason today that most of the religious community is on the way down is the subjects of the lectures of almost all the rabbis in the world. When you go to Eretz Israel, please, come. Yeah. Oh, uh. He didn't believe you're going to have to use all these chairs. Baruch Hashem. Good news. Yeah. But you see, Hashem gave you Ruach HaKodesh to get extra... F- How many chairs extra you got? Extra 40? Baruch Hashem. Thank you. Here, sit here. One of you see here. Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. So, one of the one of the reasons that the Jewish communities, the Jewish from community, especially here in America, is instead of going higher, it's going lower, is the subject and the style of the speakers who give lectures. Let me explain what I mean. You know, we have, Baruch Hashem, hundreds of hundreds of communities. And the communities have lots of brilliant rabbis, Talmidei Chachamim, who knows a lot of Torah, and many of them are very righteous. And they don't need my approval for that, Baruch Hashem. But there's one thing I say, and it's not my opinion. What I say now was, was said actually by the Chafetz Chaim, which I'm very happy that he was an Ashkenazi European rabbi, because you won't translate it as a Sephardic opinion of some fanatic rabbi from Israel. It's one of the leaders of the Ashkenazi communities all over the world, and a holy, very righteous man. And this is what he said about almost a hundred years ago. He made a convention, and he got all the European rabbis around Radi, Radin, to come. And this is what he said. He said, this, remember, this was in a generation that there was no television, no internet, no Facebook, no style of the goyim in our clothing, none of the things that we have today. <laughs> Life was very simple. Jews did not have the freedom they have today. And... The Chafetz Chaim, he called all the rabbis, the leaders of the communities, and this is what he said to them. He said to them, in previous generations, the rabbis only spoke about one subject. One subject. What was it? Reward and punishment. Heaven and hell. And now, nobody speaking about it, the Chafetz Chaim say. Everyone stopped speaking about it. Not only, he said to those rabbis, that you do not help the Jewish soul, you're damaging the Jewish soul. In your lectures, 
not only that you're not productive and bringing people closer to Hashem, you're actually making people going far away from Hashem. This is in a generation that was about a thousand times better than today. A thousand times better. So the Chafetz Chaim say to everyone, I encourage each one of you to go back to the old fashion, the old style. When you come and sit in front of an audience, you have to blow them up. That's my words. He didn't say this word, but that's what he meant. He said you have to be very strict, and you have to make sure everybody understands that if they continue in their fake form lifestyle, this is the price they're going to pay in the end. That's what the Chafetz Chaim said. I want to repeat his words, but I want to develop it a little bit, because the world is a different place today after so many years. And I, I would like to explain to you what I mean. I'm not saying names. I'm sure some of you would understand who I'm referring to. We're not coming here to put anyone down. It's my last thing on my mind to do. And I just want to wake us up to see how phony our life is, that it got already to the top of the top of the phone community, which means if we're not going to fix it by the root, we have no future. And this is what I mean. There are organizations that call themselves today Kiruv organizations. Kiruv. What are they doing? They're supposed to save souls. They're supposed to take secular brothers and sisters of us and get them into the, into the from communities, whenever they, wherever it is, all over the world. However, in my opinion, not only that they are not actually doing it, they are actually making a tremendous damage to the Jewish nation with their approach. Why? Because they come to all the secular people who basically every minute of their life is a horrible sin. They live in the worst sins that you can imagine. There's not one hour they're not violating some Isur Karet. And every Shabbat they make about a million Isur Karet in an average Shabbat. Many of them live with uh, non-Jewish spouse. Many of them, their children are not even Jewish. They eat non-kosher. They speak Lashonara all day. They steal. They cheat. They do horrible things. Uh, the list of the sins in the Torah is clear to every one of us. And these people, basically, if they die today, there's no question that they have no share to the world to come, according to what Hashem says in the Torah. So instead of coming and educate them and prove to them that the Torah is divine and the next step is to shake them up to see that if they continue in their fake lifestyle, there's going to be a very heavy price to pay, not only they're not doing it, they're actually, actually forcing them to stay wicked for the rest of their life with their lousy approach, which means they tell them there's no such thing Chiloni, there's no such thing secular Jew, we're all holy. We're all the children of God. God loves us all equally. We all go to the world to come. We all have every Jew as a ticket to the world to come. Call Israel, Yishlaim, Chelek, Laolam, Abba. Don't believe people who tell you there's such thing hell. It's not real. Don't believe in this. That's how they talk. Now what happened? If there was any chance that these Jews are brothers, sisters, cousins, neighbors, whatever they are, if there was any chance that they will wake up and finally realize that they are on the way to a eternal destruction, if there's any way, now this way, this chance is gone. Because they make these people feel, I'm just as righteous as the chief rabbi of Brooklyn, or Queens. Because according to those McCarvin, I'm 100% perfect. He said, there's no difference between you and this religious uh, person, so why should I change? Why should I make any change in my life? There's no reason. Why? I'm perfectly fine according to them. Not only that, the way of the secular people, and soon I'm going to get to us as Fum people, soon. The way of the secular people is that when a holy person, or even a simple Fum person is sitting with them in contact, and not telling them anything about what they do that it's wrong, not only that they will stay the way they are, now they feel a lot better about themselves. Because yeah, if the rabbi was sitting next to me, and he didn't tell me anything about coming with a car on Shabbat, or he didn't tell me anything about bringing my wife Christine into the chuppah, that means everything is fine, I'm perfectly acceptable. And now they feel so much better with their sins, that the suffering that they had before, everyone has a... Uh, a conscience inside that bothers him when he makes something wrong, it's gone. 
and now they feel much more free to continue and make bigger sins and die in their sins until the last day of their life. So first of all, we should understand that by coming and saying to people everyone is equal is the biggest sin you can think of. We have to be very, very careful with this horrible approach. I don't know who invented this foolish approach, but it's basically like taking the Torah and rip it to pieces and there's no other comparison. Every person who comes to a wicked Jew, whether he, he is aware of what he does, whether he's not aware of what he does, but right now he lives in total sin, and telling him, you great, God loves you equally like he loves every Shomer Shabbos and every Talmud Chacham that learn, dedicate all his life for the Torah, first of all, is a very big lie. Second of all, it makes God very angry. Why did I bother write half of the Torah warnings and punishments that this Jew would come in one second and erase my Torah and modify it and make it something different than what I gave in Mount Sinai? Who gives us permission to take the Torah and change one sentence in the Torah? Who gave us permission to come to a Jew with Michal and Shabbos all his life and tell him, don't worry, you're great, you're also going to heaven? Who? The Torah never said it. The Torah said 12 times he has no share to the world to come. The Torah said that these people have a horrible end. So who gave us 3,300 years later permission to take it and put an X and modify the Torah? Even the reform movement who today marry men with men and, and Yosef with Christine every hour, they never dare to erase one word of the written Torah. Did you know that? The reform movements that basically step on the Torah with their feet every second and spit in the face of God nonstop, and make a joke out of our Torah, even they never dare to take the written Torah and change one word inside. All they had to do is when the Torah said, do not marry men with men, they just erased the, you should not, one word not, you should. And then everything, it'll go according to their wish, that's what they want to do. Or they said, lo titchaten bam, with the goyim, do not marry them, they erased the law, two letters, they erased the law. And it's going to be, you're allowed to marry them. It will be a lot easier for them. Because today they say, well, you have your Torah, we have our Torah. Prove that yours is right. Look, in our Torah it says to marry. And in our Torah it says mitzvah to steal. And in our Torah it says mitzvah to create fire on Shabbat. Whatever your Torah says, our Torah says the opposite. But they never dare to do it. They come with all kinds of excuses. In the old days, it used to be hard to make fire. Today, it's easy to make fire. That's not what Hashem meant. It's, a, it's a metaphoric. It comes with lots of excuses. But I never dare to erase one letter of the Torah. But we do it. We, the Frum, very orthodox people, that's what we do. We come to these people and tell them, you are great. You are very good. The one person promised that every one of us will have the same end, and that's what the people live with. And when finally one person come and say the truth, they say, ah, don't listen to him. He's fanatic, he's crazy, he's extreme. But the Torah is extreme. Let's be honest. Did you ever read the Torah? Those people who give all these speeches and say, Hashem is merciful, there's no punishment, there's no such thing, hell. Did they ever read the Torah? Are they not afraid to come and know, they know inside the heart that the Torah is very, very strict. And Hashem has two sides. He has the merciful side, and he has the very angry, strict side. And when the sinners do too much sins, he basically destroyed them with no mercy. And it happened millions of times in history. Didn't we just see the last Holocaust? What happened? Why, where, do we, where is this illusion that we come up with? We see we're going to stay in the Facebook. We're going to stay in the Internet. We're going to continue to dress like I don't want to say how. We will continue with our fake lifestyle. We will continue with the television and vacation, and we will fold our beards, and we're going to hide our peot, and we're going to pretend that we whatever we are, and everything will be fine. It's just not going to be fine. It's going to be very bad. And we have to wake up, because when you don't wake up, the way of the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, that every time you go to a lower level, He's not okay with that. He's right away planning the next trap. And if we be honest with ourselves, let, let's look at how we used to be 10 years ago, and let's look how we are today. 
only 10 years with what's happening out there, all this materialism and fashion and whatever is happening around us, we are way less than what we should have been. Anyone here thinks today is more full than 10 years ago? I'm talking not the ones who Baalei Tshuva. The Baalei Tshuva usually have, they are more serious because they left this phony world to achieve something. What's the point of lying to themselves? I'm talking those who were born Shomer Shabbos to a full family. Do you think that today you're closer to Hashem than 10 years ago? If today you are not closer to Hashem than yesterday, that's already a tragedy. Forget 10 years ago. For then yesterday. Why? Because a kosher Jew must go up every day. If you stand at the same level, it's like a dead person. Yoshev batel kemet dami, the Torah says. Someone who sits and do nothing and does not achieve any credit, any progress, is considered like dead in those days. Not to talk about all the other things. Let's read to you some of the things I'm talking about. First of all, the Torah says... Hashem said, the prophet Yeshayahu, Yeshaya, Isaiah 29, in the name of Hashem, this is what he said, Ya'an ki nigash ha'am hazeh befiv ubisfatav chibduni velibo rachak mimeni. Everyone is going to pay the price, Hashem say. Why? Because in their mouth, in their lips, they respect me. But their heart is very far away from me. person can look from the outside at Chief Rebbe. Mamash, you never believe that this person has no heart and no connection to Hashem. I always give an example. If a person claims that he's a big Rebbe or big Tzaddik, like some people may think, because they read about him in a newspaper, how would you know if he's a Tzaddik? The Gemara say, Three things you can measure the level of the righteousness of a person. Bekoso, kiso, ve kaso. Sounds the same. Koso. His manners, how he eats, how he drinks, how he talks. That's all, all going on into the manners. Derech eretz. Kaso is anger, is midot. Stingy, angry, angry, every little thing make a big deal. Scream, curse, break things. And, and kiso means financially. If those three are good by you, then there's a chance you're tzaddik. If not, you're definitely not a rabbi, and you're not even a simple tzaddik. And if there are foolish people who think you're a rabbi and they kiss your hand, no, you're lucky you have a lot of foolish people around you. Many people thought the golden calf is God. Doesn't make him God. Just because you have a beautiful beard and you walk in the street and you clean the streets of Brooklyn as you walk, and you have a $500 sombrero, and there are enough foolish people who kiss your hands, and they come and they give you little notes to bless it, and you have $80 million in your bank account until the Israeli FBI publish you, for 30 years you make a beautiful party around your fools, doesn't mean you're a holy person in Shamaim. You're holy for your community. You're holy for the foolish people around you. Like one person told me, I told him, stay away from this one, it's fake. He told me, if he tells me to eat pork, I will eat. That's what he answered me. Then I know there's no point of wasting time on him. If he tells me to eat chazir, and yochel, he said. So the, the point is, that how do you know if a person is really holy? Test him in money. Why, if he's a landlord, one month you're not paying the rent, see how he behaves. See what happened the 15th of the month arrived and he still didn't get his rent. What happened to this holy that goes like this and everyone sings to him, the Mashiach arrived, calling, screaming, shame on you, you're not paying the rent, this, I'm going to call this, I'm going to call that. Two, three months, he send you the Italian mafia. <laughs> That's one thing. Second, second, A person has to be honest, not only when it comes to money and business and the way he speaks, on advarim it's called, not to deceive people. A person has to be honest in his heart. What's the difference between being honest in your actions and being honest in your heart? Being honest in the heart is a higher level. Why? Sometimes a person, his heart is crooked, but he forces himself to do honest things. Like he's dying to steal, and he knows Hashem is watching, so he's afraid, so he's not stealing. He has an opportunity. 
He's dying, someone asked him, he has a Vegas store, the two nights from today, he's dying to say yes. He doesn't want to say it's from a week ago, but he's afraid to say, he's afraid to say yes, because he learned today in the shiur that it's basically like stealing money from his pocket. So he said, no, it's not from today, but his heart is burning. But there's a higher level. There's a level that you can adjust your heart to be pure like Hashem. Pure, which means you don't even have the urge to lie and to steal and to touch something that is not yours. It gets to a point that even if somebody gives you a gift and you know this person is working on Shabbat, which technically you're allowed to receive this gift, halacha-wise, you don't want to touch it because you are disgusted from it. Not because it's not allowed, because your heart doesn't let you. Like the Baba Sali used to be a very holy man. He used to bring him money. And if he had just had any suspicion that the person who gave him the money is not a, a real firm Jew, he didn't want to take the money. No matter how much money, he didn't want to take it. And there's some other ones that when they said they want, they were investigating what's the source of the money. And if there was no way to find out, they did, what they do, they took that money and they separated it and they used it for soap, for bathrooms, for toilet papers. They never put it into the yeshiva circulation of money. They just isolated it. They said, there's a doubt about this money. Let's use it for gas, for the car, for electric, but not really for Torah. Why? Because they already reached such level, their heart was so clean, they couldn't touch such money. We are very far from it. We always look for a short, shortcut. Ah, it's kosher? Fine. The rabbi from Texas said, it's kosher? Which rabbi? What's his name? Rabbi Davis, how do you know he's orthodox? Maybe he has a husband. <laughs> how do you know? Rabbi Davis. A few years ago, and they saw on 10, 10 News, the rabbi murdered his wife by hiring a hitman. The rabbi. Which rabbi? The head reform rabbi of some, on New Jersey somewhere. Calls himself a rabbi. Eat pork for, for kiddush on Shabbat. C calling himself a rabbi. You have a kosher rabbi here in the community, and him, they both called rabbi. Today, everyone is a rabbi. If you have a nice beard, everyone call you rabbi. Especially if they're in community, nobody dressed like this. You put a black hat, you come to a community, no one has a hat. Right away, they give you the chair in the Mizrach. It doesn't matter that you're two weeks bald, Shuvah, you don't know how to read Rashi. <laughs> right away, rabbi, rabbi. <laughs> I know how it is. <laughs> All right. So Hashem said, it's not impressing me that from the outside all day they read Tehillim and going like this and all kinds of fake faces when they pray and when the woman light the candle she has tears and she goes like this and that she already has a, a vacation planned to Cancun she's gonna sit on the beach with her bikini with her maids five maids they're gonna take care of the kids and the amigos around will see her half naked and she stand on Shabbat, Hashem, send us Parnassah, that we can make more scenes, help us. It's not, Cancun, it's not enough. It's only in this world count this beautiful show. But in Shamaim, it's, I always say, Hashem doesn't expect from the Chilonim anymore. The first Chilonim, the first secular Jews, they knew the truth, but they didn't want to keep it. So they started to do everything they can to twist it. The secular people today, the third or fourth generation already, they have no idea what they live for. I always say they have no idea. For sure, they have no idea what they live for. Don't expect them to be religious. They do not know what they live. Ask them what's the purpose of life, nobody knows. So from them you expect Hashem to get angry? Hashem is not angry at them. He knows what they are. It's, in Hebrew it's like Baalei Chaim. It's like you're born in a safari. You don't know what's going on. You have no direction. Your teachers in school, what kind of teachers they have over there? They teach them that they came from the monkey. They teach them it's very good to do all the sins in the world. They teach them everything the opposite of the truth. And then after 20 years of false education, you expect them to be righteous? Hashem knows from them the Yeshua will not come. Salvation won't come from this kind of Jews. We are the soldiers of Hashem that mess up. From us, he's very upset. Because everyone who sits here tonight, he knows what Hashem expects from him. Whether we do or not, that's another whole story. But from us, Hashem expects. Every woman here who leaves the house after 45 minutes that she puts a show and she calculates the skirt by the millimeter that's going to be under the knee, because that's the halakha, but 
חס וחלילה, that they won't be one centimeter longer, you know, חס ושלום, and tons of makeup, and, and she knows that the wig has to be modest, but of course, it's not, it's not going to attract enough attention. So she leaves one leg in Bnei Brak, one leg in San Francisco. You understand? And every, every moment of her life is one second she's Sarah Imenu, the next thing I don't want to tell you who she is. You understand? And, and this kind of life, one leg over here, one leg there, you know, it's like a, there's, a, there's called Chum Shabbat. You know what Chum Shabbat means? There is, the, there is the date, the date line in the middle of the ocean, somewhere around Japan. There is, it's called Kava Tarikh, the date line. So I have a solution for you. If it's hard for you to keep Shabbat, take your beautiful yacht, put it over there. And now, if, if this is the date line, somewhere in the middle of the ocean there's a line, which means if you go one step to the right of this line, it's Shabbat. You go one step to this line, it's already Sunday in the date. No joke. So you can put your, your boat across. You go to this little side of the boat, you do kiddush, you finish, you're there. Now you want to smoke your cigarette, you go over there, smigar, you go back, no, that. Like this, no problem, no chilul Shabbat. Technically, it's not a joke. It's even a question, halacha could be even kosher. Well, what do you want? Over here it's Sunday. You know? Everything has a terim. Everything. You know how they made a joke now in Israel in the election? The religious party, they put an advertisement <laughs> that one Israeli is about to marry a Russian girl. So in the middle of the chupa, the rabbi is over there, and everyone, <laughs> Itzik and Christine is getting married in Israel. <laughs> so in the middle of the chupa, the rabbi is checking. They found out she's not Jewish. So she said, no, wait one minute. In one minute, I'll be Jewish. The fax is on the way. <laughs> the fax came. Okay, mazal tov, you're Jewish. Now you can get married. That's how they did it in Israel. Want to get married? You want to be Jewish? One, two, three, finish. So, it says like this. Sheerit Israel lo yasu avla. ולא ידברו חזב, ולא יימצא בפיהם לשון תרמית. Translation, the left over from Israel will not deceive, will not lie, and will not have a tricky language in their mouth. Who knows what this verse is referring to? To what days? Is it... Always, or is spe speaking about a specific time. I repeat, the leftover from Israel will not deceive, will not lie, and will not have a tricky language in their mouth. Many people say, don't worry. You all tzaddikim, Mashiach come. Lots of from people pray for Mashiach every day. But if Mashiach come today, this from people will vanish in a moment. They're not going to see Mashiach. It's very simple. We say every morning in a prayer, Uva Zion Goel, the Savior come to Zion, Leshave Pesha Be'Yaakov. The Mashiach coming for who? For the soccer games on Shabbat in Yerushalayim? 20,000 Mechalele Shabbat come to see few people kick a piece of leather into the net? For them the Mashiach comes, or he comes to the village in Manhattan for this kosher restaurant who opens on Shabbat, and some black guitar player play blues, for them the Mashiach is coming. The Mashiach comes for all the cheaters, for all the liars, for all the thing, people who make all kinds of scenes, or steal millions and, and forge signatures and put innocent people in jail or for from Jews who have a little yarmulke size of a quarter and sit in a Supreme Court and go against the law of God just because they want to be a judge or an important criminal lawyer for this kind of from Jews, for them the Mashiach come? The answer, of course not. These people live in illusion. Uva le'tzion goel, le'shave pesha be'yakov. 
the, the, the Savior, the Mashiach, will come for only those who make real tshuva, not fake tshuva. To grow a beard is for free. Yamaka is three dollars. Five if you're in Monsi. But that's it. In five dollars you become religious today. Very easy. If you want to invest a little more, so you buy a black hat, another hundred and twenty bucks. No? Very thin, very cheap. One day of work, you can be religious already from the outside. White chair, twenty dollars in Costco. No, what else? That's not considered religious from the outside. Who cares about the outside? And right here it says, what does it say? Those Jews who would be left, which means many will not survive. It's a verse. Sheerit Israel, those who would left by Israel. In Yetziat Mitzrayim, in the Exodus of Egypt, 80% died in the darkness. 80%. More than 3 million came out. How many died? Double than the Holocaust. Double than the Holocaust. If 3 million came and it's 20%, 12 million at least died. There's different opinions. According to one opinion, 60 million died. But let's go on a minimum. Even the minimum, it's horrible enough. Double than the Holocaust. And not only that, in the Holocaust in Germany, we keep see, saying that 6 million Jews died. In my opinion, not even three million died. It's still a ho horrible number, but less than half of what we say. Why? You know how many of them were married to Goim and their children are Goim? According to the Nazis, his wife is German, she married a Jew. Doesn't matter, they kill him and her and the kids. They all consider Jewish. But according to the Torah, all these four kids of him are all Goim. Many Goim died. Hitler killed German, pure Germans, with German Amalekim salt. He killed his own brothers. So, since there was a, an epidemic on intermarriage in Germany and some other countries, many of the people who were put in the gas chambers were pure goyim. We count them as a part of the tragedy, because the bigger the number is, the easier it's, it will be to have a pity among the nations and to establish the Israeli states and all kinds of other things. If we say one million, if we say six million, obviously six million make more impression. But technically, and well, the reason is because mo most of the secular people, professor who speaks about the Holocaust, they don't even know the difference between a Jew and a Goy. They don't even know that if an Israeli man marry a, a non-Jewish woman, that the kids are not, not Jewish even by one percent. They do not know. For them, they're Jewish, just because they agree they want to live in Israel. They don't even know. So Hashem says, those who would be left, <coughs> listen what he says, he doesn't speak about any mitzvah. One thing, the entire three terms are about honesty and integrity. To show you how important it is to be honest in a business. What did he say? Sheerit Israel, those Jews who would survive, I already guarantee you, they'll never deceive, they'll never lie, they'll never be tricky. Which means if that's what we are now, we won't survive. Even if we have a beautiful beard. Even if we have a big black hat. And we pray not three times a day, 30 times a day. And we read Tehillim non-stop. And we keep Shabbos. And we eat lots of Kugel on Shabbos. But we are not honest in the business. We lie. We trick. I'll give you an example. There are plenty of Jewish lawyers. Plenty. Each one of them, I do not know, I have a few friends that are lawyers, but I don't really know enough to know. But my common sense is telling me that it will be very hard to find even one of them 100% with clean hands. Why? How do I know? Because I hear, 17 years I hear complaints from Jews about their personal problems. Women, men, even teenagers, they all call me with their problems. One very common problem that I find, that every couple who wants to go through divorce, the lawyers suck their blood. They destroy them. Actually, the real enemy of people who go to, who go to court to get divorced, they want a clean, fast divorce, and the lawyers never let it happen. They stretch it as much as they can until they leave them without a penny. 
and I heard it hundreds of times. If once or twice, maybe they exaggerate. Everywhere I go in America, they all come and say, my lawyer doesn't let the case end. Stretch it more and more. It's 10 more thousand, 20 more. He already took one house. He took another house. He left us with nothing. In the end, I know one woman from Florida, her and her husband paid $50 million to the lawyers to get divorced. She paid $19 million and her husband paid $31 million. Very wealthy couple. What did the lawyer do? How many hours did he work on a case? 500 hours? Did he sweat and picked up weights all night? Did he run nonstop for a month? It's worth it to make $50 million on filling up some paperwork and speak a few hours in front of a judge? Destroy them. $50 million. Not to talk about criminal lawyers. Some of them have yamakas and some judges. I know one. I have a friend, judge, in a secular court. And I asked him this question and didn't have an answer. But his hands were not shaking enough. He got nervous a little bit. I asked him, How, what are you going to do when you come in front of Hashem? And Hashem will show you that you sent many Jews and non-Jews that according to the Torah are fully innocent to many years in prison. For the day you took their freedom away, you're going to have to pay for them, for their children, grandchildren. His punishment will never end. Just because you want to make $200,000 a year and be called your honor, for that he's going to lose everything as a Shomer Shabbos judge. He tried to make some arguments, but he saw right away it's not going to help. Did he quit being a judge? No. I have a cousin, a judge in Israel. Same thing. He sends, according to the Torah, he sends innocent people. Why? Because every Jew who is trialed in a secular court, it's a mistrial right away, according to the Torah. Because all the witnesses that they use are all wicked people, and they cannot be witnesses. If a Mechal and Shabbos testify that you stole, they cannot do anything to you. Mechal and Shabbos testify that you raped or murdered, they cannot touch you. Hashem says someone who is not, Mechal, is not Shomer Shabbos is not a Jew. A Goy cannot testify in a Jewish court. That's it. End of story. So someone is Mechalel Shabbat, he doesn't care about his own soul that will be destroyed for eternity. He care about you, he can make up any story against you. He doesn't fear his own fortune, his own future. How can we rely on him to give the right testimony? If we have fear from God, we are allowed to accept the testimony from him. But if not, how can we even gamble? to listen to this person that doesn't care about his own soul. He cannot step into my court, God said. Needless to say, the judge himself. If a, if a judge ha has a boyfriend that he lives with, according to the Torah, he has to get execution. He has no right to live. How can he judge life and death of other people? So basically, think about what's happening here. Every Jew went to prison in the United States, even if he was guilty. Many times they judge and they find the people guilty. They have recordings, they have everything. Technically, in a, in a religious court, they will be also guilty. You couldn't hide it. The fact that they didn't have a kosher trial in front of three rabbis that had Zirat Shamaim and the witnesses were not Shomer Shabbat, any punishment they got you're going to have to pay for it. If you're the judge, or you're the criminal lawyer, or even if you're the defense. It's horrible. If a Jew takes another Jew, two from Jews, to a secular court, right there enough, he cannot be a part of a minyan anymore. You know how many of them are here in the community that every week they sue somebody else? If you take another Jew to a secular court, or a non-Jewish court, by doing that, automatically you cannot be counted as one of the tent in a minyan. You come to the shul, Yom Kippur, nine people in a shul, they want to take out the Sefer Torah, Kol Nidre. You are there, they cannot take the Sefer Torah, cannot say Kaddish, nothing. Nothing. They have to vomit you from the community. Your children cannot be accepted to yeshivot. Horrible thing. It's Kol Moser, Din Moser. It's a horrible thing. Did you know that? Now, we are, we are, some of us, are the problem. 
We are, we are Moser, we are telling, we are calling the FBI, we are telling about people about, to the IRS about another Jew who didn't pay enough taxes. We are doing this. You know how many times people calling me a minute before they do it? Wives about their ex-husband or things like that, that they doesn't pay enough child support. So now she decided he's going to go to prison 20 years in federal prison because he gives her $1,000 less every month. She became the judge. Yeah, I deserve a punishment. I'm not saying no. But when we don't know the halakha, we don't know the rules, we're destroying ourselves. What's the point after that to keep mitzvot another 20 years when we already don't have a share to the world to come? We are basically wasted already. So those who would survive already will not be crooks. Then Hashem says, "Vavatem et Hashem elokechem." You would serve your God, and as a result, "Uverachet lachmecha veet memecha." He will bless your food and your water. Veesarti amachala mikirbecha, and I will remove all the sicknesses from among you. We are now today in a situation that God is curing us or basically sending us more and more sicknesses. What, in what situation we are? Just to review the cancer level, the amount of cancer in our Frum community, it's enough for every intelligent human being to understand that God is furious at us, not angry, furious at us. Almost every other person has cancer today. Do you understand what's happening there? You maybe not know. But it's not 10 minutes that I don't get a text message about a new cancer patient. Just as one individual, every 10 minutes, a new case. Imagine how many out there that they don't know me. They don't know to send me a text, pray for him, pray for that, pray for that. An epidemic. Many of the women who dress not modest, they'll get angry when you tell them... <coughs> One out of eight women get breast cancer in the world today. One out of eight. It was one out of nine three years ago. Now it went to one out of eight. Maybe another three years will be one of seven. Maybe another third years it'll be one out of two. Because it's constantly growing. So when you tell them, they say, well, cellular phone, high voltage uh, wires, technology, we have to find out the source of the cancer. But a, a Jew that knows that Hashem is the doctor of the world, he removes the sicknesses and he sent them speaking like that, cellular phone, technology, that, this. It's such kfira. How can you call yourself religious by saying these things? Everything that happens is from Hashem. Bankruptcies, problems, many people die single, they cannot find their soulmate. Horrible sicknesses, the Arab are choking us more and more every year around Israel. We lose more parts of the land, and they're becoming stronger and stronger in Hamas and Hezbollah in Iran. Every week, Iran published a new news. Today, they invented a new tank. Last week, it, 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 they sent a monkey to, to the moon. I don't know to where. So, some kind of a monkey, it sends. <laughs> you know, they're inventing their own technology. They're becoming already almost advanced as Israel. When it comes to, remember, the Iranians are not Arabs. The Arab never invented one thing in the history. Did you know that? The Arabs, one and a half billion Arabs, they have plenty of money. And they have blessing that God gave them the oil. But you don't have one Arab invention, not in medicine, not in technology, not in anything. They have beautiful music. Some f films, music, you know, all kinds of things, some nice rugs there, but inventions? Nothing to talk about. In Yad Vashem in Israel, in Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum, they have a special site. They have 20,000 names of Goim, what we call Hasidei Umot Aolam, righteous Gentiles who saved Jews, and risked their life saving Jews in a holocaust. 20,000 names! Not one of them is Arab. <coughs> Not one even. Only Christians, all kinds, European, Americans, whatever. 
Not one of them is an Arab person. 20,000, not one Arab saved the Jew in the Holocaust? Yes. So, you tell a woman, you're not afraid? You're not afraid that you enter the horrible statistic? Right, when you ask the question right away, you become her enemy for the rest of your life. If you expect her ever to hear one of your lectures, you can forget about it. Why? He intimidated me. He, you know, he put some pressure on me. He cursed me. Everyone adds salt and pepper to the story. He wished me to die. He wished me to get cancer. You know, they all like to make it more bombastic. Chaz v'shalom, nobody wish anyone bad. I wish we don't have to be speaking here and talking about these things. But statistics shows that one out of eight is receiving it. What's the second cancer? In the wound. Sartan arechem. Parts of the inside of the wound. And what's the third one? In the brain. Tumors. The three organs that participate in all the sex crimes in the world are affected immediately. The breast, number one, the wound, and the brain. He said, no, maybe it's coincidence. By the men, the most popular cancer, what is it? Prostate cancer. No, it's coincidence, everything coincidence. No, it's not coincidence. And they also found that the breast cancer in cities where beaches are, it's higher than other cities. That's statistic, I have an article about it. Like in Long Island, it's higher than other places. Why? Because these women spend more time on the beach. More million people watch her naked walking all day around. So that's increased the chance that Hashem is more angry at her. It's called Mahti Arabim. Making a man enjoy your body, especially all these married women who walks in front of men all day like this. When her husband come home, she cover with a potato sack. <laughs> when she goes to the supermarket, 45 minutes. Where is my wig? <laughs> Amigo, Jose, Vini, how, how are you? I, I, I don't have enough milk. Two, three items, 45 minutes. Good thing she took her diamond clips and put it over here and fixed her beautiful... Ah, she has to go to the supermarket. Ma, the amigos will see her with a potato sack on her head. But her husband, it's okay. He's used to me already. Ah, we're 20 years married already. <laughs> you know, a woman, she has an obligation. Let's start with the man's obligation. Man has an obligation the day he gets married to give his wife a place to live, clothes to wear, food to eat, and intimate relationship. If a man say to her, I don't have time for you, I'm developing uh, uh, an invention, uh, I'm in a, in a business stress, I have to go away for six months, all kinds of things like this, and the wife is upset because of that, he actually violated his contract that he signed on the day he got married. But this contract is a contract as a mitzvah from Hashem. Hashem says, that marriage means the man must give a place to live and food and clothes to wear and intimate relationship. As much as she wants, one time a week, two times a week, whatever it is, that's what he has. It's an obligation. If he doesn't do it, it's like eating pork. It's like, like putting tefillin. That's a sin from the Torah. That's a sin from the Torah. Most men do not have an idea what they sign in the Ketubah. They only know that they put $55,555.55. That the eyes of all the jealous people will go up. Chaz v'shalom, maybe not going to be Ayn Ara. That's all they know. They don't even know that in case that they get divorced, they must pay this money. Ah, to buy it just for the, for the closet. But that's the man's obligation. What's the wife's obligation? Besides being the foundation of the house, Besides of being modest and raising the children and being supportive and cook and all the rest, she has one obligation that most women are not aware of because most speakers are afraid to speak about it. What is it? She must stay pretty for her husband 
just as he met her. She has no permission not to gain weight, not to neglect her skin, not to whatever she does. Ah, we already married already. He's used to me already. Right? He knows how I look. In the beginning, you know, I put some efforts to look pretty. But now, after four children, you expect me to be like I was in my 20s? Yes. Where does it say it in the Torah? Who knows? The Gemara say a few stories. One rabbi had a horrible wife. Horrible. His student told him, Rabbi, why don't you divorce her? So he said, I don't have enough money to pay her ktuba. So they said, we'll give you the money. We raise the money, we'll pay her ktuba. Divorce her. What the answer? He says, it's enough. She's raising my children in a good way. It's already worth it for me to keep it. And then one more thing. She saves me from the sin. The Gemara say, they came to the, to the son of Chonia Ma'agel. Chonia Ma'agel was in some kind of a coma for 70 years. 70 years coma. Arik Sharon is competing with him. Seven years. He's seven years. He, he, he woke up after seven years. He saw someone from seven years ago. He was mamash in coma for seven years in the time of the Talmud. Chon Yamagel. He had a, a special skill that when he prayed for rain, right away the rain started. And it stayed in his family. They have this gift. So he came to his son and he was walking in a field. The Chachamim came to ask him to pray for rain. So he didn't want to answer them because he didn't want to steal from his boss. If he started a conversation with him, the one minute that he won't walk in the field, he said, I'm stealing from my boss. So they followed him to his home, and they saw his wife coming out all fancy to welcome him on the street. So when they came, so he asked his wife to go upstairs first, and he walked behind her, and they walked behind him. Later, they sat down, so they asked him, can we ask you a few questions, Rabbi? So he said, yes. He said, when we came to you in the field, why you didn't say hello to us? He said, I don't want to steal from my boss. When we, when we came out, how come your wife came to you all fancy? Doesn't she know it's not modest? So he said, she is doing what she must do, being pretty for me to save me from not looking at other women. And this was a person, supposedly, from the story, the holiest person in the world 2,000 years ago, not today. So imagine Rav Eliashiv, or Rav Ovadia Yosef, or Rav Steinman, one, one figure like that, in today's time, multiplied by a million. And he said, if my wife won't be pretty for me, I look at other women on the street. That's what he says. So she is doing everything she can to be pretty for me, to save me from looking at other women. That's already closed all the arguments today, I, I assume. So then they ask him, but how come you let your wife go first? Don't you know a man is not supposed to go after a woman on the stairs? So he said, if I go first and she go behind me, then, then you're going to see her. How do I know who you are? Now this was the representative of the Jewish court, of the Bedin. Holy rabbis came. He didn't trust them with his wife. Why? The Gemara says, "En apotropos laarayot." And there's hundreds of examples like this. Hundreds of examples like this. <laughs> so a woman, by keeping herself pretty and not overweight, and taking care of her aesthetically, she actually does a mitzvah from the Torah, and saving her husband from horrible sins. And if her husband's going to start with sins out there, her family doesn't have that much of a future. Because one thing leads to another, and I don't want to tell you what's happening today in our communities. <laughs> so, we think we're from, we think we're righteous, some of us at least. But sometimes it's not the case. Then Hashem says, let's say first the words of the Chazonish. Chazonish not, besides being a huge Talmud Chacham, according to all standards and all generations, living very simple lifestyle, very, very simple lifestyle, a chair, a table, a little metal bed, iron bed, very small place, never changed his hat all his life. Today, a poor person replaces his hat every year. 
Chazon Ish, the same hat all his life. Lived very simple life. Never looked at himself in a mirror. One time they took him to a place, he came out of the elevator, there was a big mirror on the wall, he went like this, hello. <laughs> Told him, Rabbi, it's you. Never looked at it, he doesn't have a mirror in his house. So, the Chazon Ish, this is what he wrote, listen good. It says, Im is ke adam. If a person will have, will merit. Leargish et ara ve'anim as. If a person will merit to feel the bed and getting sick being sick and tired of not knowing Torah let me translate to simple English he said if a person will get to a moment in his life he's talking about a man here will get to a moment in his life that he will sit alone and what we call in Hebrew Cheshbo Nefesh he's calculating my situation right now in life and he, he will have serious sadness by knowing basically I did not achieve any Torah skills no knowledge in Torah, nothing I'm nothing, total loser in Torah that's how he thinks Ad she imas levavo bebechi until he get to a point that his heart will melt, melt, you know, melt like boiled from tears. Who can raise his hand here and say that he had one moment on his life, forget about what's the reason, one minute on his life that he felt that he's not only cried because he got upset he lost a hundred dollars in a stock market or he got a ticket. No, not because of that that he felt that his heart really melt, like that said, there's no heart left in my chest, from something that happened. So the Chazoni say, if a person will realize, look at me, 30, 40, 50, 70 years, supposedly religious, do not know anything, one sugiya in the Talmud I don't know. Now I know what you're thinking. How can it be? A full person is learning at least an hour a day, Dafyomi comes every day, Balabait, some of us learn in yeshivot many years. I want to make a deal with you. You bring me anyone you know, anyone you know, I'm serious, I know it sounds a huge exaggeration, but you can test me on that. That you consider him a Talmud Chacham, that he knows one sugiya in a shas, 100%, I'll give you a prize. One sugiya from thousands of sugiyot in a shas, even a person who learned 30 years, especially from America, that would know the entire sugiya from A to Z. What's the opinion of Rashi, the opinion of Tosfot, how it collides, what parts of what they say is mutual, what parts is against each other, how does it comply with all the other places in the Shas that the same rabbis are speaking in different topics, how to put the whole picture. Most of us know roughly, roughly. It's like you know direction, someone gives you direction. Roughly I know, roughly. I cannot swear I know all the details. 60, 70, 80 percent maybe I know. But to know what, and even if they ask you to speak about what you just learned, you know more or less and you can make a very good impression. But if one serious Talmud Chacham sits in front of you, he can shake you up you, and in the end you say, you know what, I'm confused, I don't know. It's very deep. What do you think, it's a joke? It's very, very deep. But I'm not talking about this. Don't get scared. I wish we would know roughly. Roughly. Everything I'm talking about is roughly, for our level. So I'm saying, the Chazoni say, until a person will get to a point that his heart will melt in front of Hashem. That person should know, in a yeda adam, ki kvar zacha arbe. This person should know that he already gained a lot. What did he gain? He doesn't know one page of Gemara in his life. One chapter in Shulchan Aruch, good, he doesn't know. He basically knows nothing. But the fact, listen good what he's writing here. It's the truth of Hashem, the truth, 100, 1 million percent the truth. The fact that he got one minute on his life, one minute, to a level that he realized what a loser I am, and he made him start crying about his situation. 
he already should know that he gained a lot. How lucky this person is. He's already, Chazonis say, has a guarantee that after those tears broken out, and he started to cry about his situation in front of Hashem, that now everything he will ask for, Hashem will give him. So how come it doesn't happen to us? How come it doesn't happen to us? I'll tell you how come. There's one rule in life, and I know it's very disturbing what I'm about to say. I know it applies to all of us, all of us, and with no exception. But you know how it is, the truth hurts, what can I do? The reason why it doesn't happen to us, some people, it happens to them every day. Rav Steinman, every lecture he gave in yeshiva, he started to, to cry. Every day, when he used to come to one, one story from the Talmud, right away he was starting to cry. I know people like this. They speak about something, you see the tears coming out. They have a pure neshama. But why 99% of the people, it doesn't happen to them? Because there is one rule that we have to know. The more a person is in love with material, with fancy, schmancy things, how the chandelier is going to be, how the pictures, how this, how that, how everything, the table and the scratch, you have to call a carpenter to paint, and the wall and every little thing, and the dishwasher is like that, and the refrigerator, I don't like the design, it doesn't match the cabinets. The more a person is in love with phony things, the far away he is from Hashem. It's a formula. The more you're in love with fake, the less you're in love with real. The more you're in love with real, the more tired you become from fake. Remember this. So now, if a person is focusing on everything that he has in this world, diamonds, watches, all kinds of things, the car, Yes, leather, not leather, sunroof, like this. Oh, I'm so upset. It's not what I order. I'm not saying you're not allowed to have a nice house. The opposite, the Gemara says, It's natural. It's normal to have a big place, to have a reasonable place. I'm talking addiction. Once it's already crossing the line of comfortable life or nice life, to an addiction that every little thing destroys you. Doesn't give you a peace of mind. Why? It's not perfect. Like I know a very wealthy family. They bought a house on the a, on a water for $20 million cash with no mortgage. And they pay one more million dollar for a designer to redesign the house. Now I tell you, if you would see how the house was designed and the day that they bought the house, you would say it couldn't be more perfect. Look like a museum in Paris. A museum. My heart was burning that they're going to burn a million dollars to redesign a place that is more designed than a museum. And guess what happened? After they designed the place, they got stuck. The people messed up the house. They had to move to a hotel. Six months they're suffering. They have to find somebody to redesign and this and that. So much aggravation because they're already sick. They are so in love with this phony world that Hashem is teaching them a lesson now. Everything goes wrong. The color, they have to repaint, they have to uh, forget about what's happening there. They lost control. So, okay, that's already an extreme case. We're not that crazy, but the more we're in love with this world, the more we care about what kind of food we eat, how delicious it is. Ten times he put spices, salt, get up again, what, what kind of dessert, how the dessert's going to look, this, change, no, bad, yeah, no, return, he goes to the restaurant, poor waiter, going back and forth all night to the clean, it's not good enough, give me a different steak, nah, it's not well done enough, it's not soft enough, it's not this, it's not that, it's already a mental disease, you know, he doesn't realize. Yeah, he cares, she is learning daf yomi every day, but he's mentally sick. His, his, his addiction is like just a person who addicted to heroin or cocaine. He's addicted to phony things. He doesn't have it, you kill him. Why some people, when you put them in jail first day, they commit suicide? Why? 
You're taking me from my beautiful lifestyle into a place like this? Life doesn't work anymore. They don't have any spirituality in their life. Someone spiritual like Yosef, they put him in jail with the worst people on earth in Egypt. He survived. Why? He had Hashem. You take a person from his beautiful mansion, you put him in jail with what's happening out there. Forget about it. He doesn't want to leave. Right away, he kill himself. Why? Because he loves the phony world. You take it away from him, he doesn't want anything. That's what the Gemara says. Every love in your life, not between you and your wife only, that you love the way she looks or her weight, and once she lost it, you cannot look at her anymore. That's besides the point. The Gemara says, every love, you love a house because of a, a certain reason. The reason is gone, the love is gone. You love a partner because of one reason. The reason is gone, the love is gone. You love this world, this phony world, the food, the design, the colors, this, that. This is gone, your life is over. You don't want to live. That's what it is. So the Chazoni says, the Torah says, Ki dvar Hashem baza. Hashem said there are Jews who not only disrespect my words, baza means disgraced. It's a disgrace. He's behaving to my Torah. It's a total disgrace. So Chazal say, who? Who would dare to disgrace Hashem? Who? Wow, we hate Hashem so much. We're going to disgrace Hashem? Chaz v'shalom. We're not in this league. Guess who? A Jew that has enough time to learn Torah and instead is watching movies on YouTube. All days with his iPhone. Cannot leave the iPhone one minute. 20 times a minute. Pick it up, put it down. Pick it up, put it down. Pick it up. In the middle of a lecture, in the middle of a meeting, parents, conference, every second. Take it out, take it in, in a car, in traffic. Cannot live without it. He has plenty of time. He has businesses, he has employees, he has managers. He doesn't need to work. One hour a day he supervises businesses. He has enough uh, servants. But what does he do? Instead of taking advantage on every hour and being closer to Hashem and dig and fill up his mind with Torah and holiness, all day nonsense. All day nonsense. I will finish with one thing. Today, it's a very, very special day for me. Why? Usually when I come from Monsi to Brooklyn, it's two and a half hours, especially in these hours. Today I made it in one hour. I'm thinking to myself, when I got to the George Washington Bridge, it looks like the end of the world is coming. <laughs> no cars, no nothing. I said, well, what, something happened? I don't know. I got on a bridge, no traffic. Get into the FDR drive. Usually I always get to about the area of the Tribal Bridge, 20 minutes right there. Shh, nothing, quiet, dark, no noise. I'm continuing all the way down. Usually I already see the line to the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge. I continue to the battery tunnel. Seven, eight cars over there, you know, on the connection to the... So what's going on over here? I get on the Brooklyn Bridge. I say, I cannot be coincidence. Call up my friend. I said to him, tell me, is something happening today in New York? <laughs> I, he said, why? I said, I never had such a beautiful ride. <laughs> one hour from once, I'm already in Brooklyn. I said, yeah, you fool, it's the Super Bowl. <laughs> I said, Shtabach Shemo, please make Super Bowl every day. <laughs> <laughs> Let them be in front of the screen. Everyone, somebody hit a piece of leather. Oh, yes, <laughs> the Mashiach arrived. <laughs> You're laughing. You know how many from Jews are in this sickness? You know how many from Jews are sitting three hours in front of the stupid screen and watching some Amigo Rodriguez or Kepasa, whatever his name is, hit a piece of leather, a round ball, and everyone scream, Yes! Wow! The Mashiach is coming! I promise you when the Mashiach would come, they'd not be so happy. With a big yamaka on their head. Some of them even have beards. 
You see them in a Yankee stadium with a baseball hat, hot dogs, standing over here, Vini the murderer over here, Mustafa the rapist over here, and Yosef Cohen from the shul in Flatbush. Yes! Why? Baseball, how can we live without it? You understand? Then they ask, how come never in a history one from Jew in America did not become Gdolador? Don't tell me Rav Kotler or Rav Moshe Feinstein. They came already from Europe, Gdolador. Someone who born in America. Can you name one rabbi in America that became one of Gdolei Ador? There are much more Torah learners in America than Israel, in case you didn't know. Maybe today not anymore. You have tens of thousands of learners here. Flatbush, Boro Park, Williamsburg, Lakewood, Monsi, Monroe, all kinds of communities all over America. There's, there's a lot of Talmud Chachamim, I'm not saying no. One of them became Rav Steyman or Rav Shach. Why? There is Torah, there is Irat Shamaim, but there's also baseball. When I put my son in yeshiva, after a few days I see my son have baseball cards, I run to the Rosh Yeshiva. I said to him, what's going on in your yeshiva? What's this? He said, ah, don't make a big deal out of it. Hey, good. It's good for them to have it. You know, I was like that also, he said. He was in, his, in that time was in his 50s. That means 30 years ago, when religion was much more serious than today, he also was like that. I had a radio, I listened to all the uh, games. So you grow up with this culture of the Greeks in your veins. Who invented sport? Sport comes from Sparta. Can't live without it. I, I saw what sport in Israel is. When they have a soccer game, on a, on a, on, besides that it's on Shabbat and 20,000 people come with cars, and 20,000 people like monkeys stand in a stadium and curse non-stop. The worst curses you can hear for three hours, two hours, whatever it is. Cursing, fighting, violence. If one guy kick the ball to the left side, 500 people, their heads are smashed, fighting, killing each other. Sometimes people get killed. Get killed. People get murdered. Why? Somebody kicked a piece of leather into the net. We gotta kill them. Throw bottles, cutting, knives. Like intifada. Living a lie. Living in a lie. That's what happened. Rav Eliezer ben David went to Argentina. I think it was in the 1970s. It was in Buenos Aires. I heard it in one of his tapes. All of a sudden, it was a quiet night. All of a sudden, in Buenos Aires, he heard such a shout. The entire neighborhood, yeah, the whole building shook. Ah, like this, for minutes. He asked the person, what's happening here? He said, there's the Mondial in Buenos Aires. Maradona hit a goal! All the Argentinians screaming on the street, crying, opening champagne, jumping into the water. So he said, that day I was so embarrassed to be a Jew. Why? Should be proud to be a Jew. <laughs> Why embarrassed? He said, I say to myself, all these tens of thousands of fools are killing themselves for nonsense like this. Would they give their heart for it? Crying, laughing, screaming, throwing money in the air. And I am a son of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, learning Torah all day after 10 hours, getting up from the Gemara. Should have run like crazy on the street, at least like these fools. What do they have that they're so happy? Nothing. What does it help the Argentinian that one, one person kicked the ball and he went into the net? No. So you know how to kick a piece of leather. Why it's bringing so much happiness? He said, I never felt so happy being a Jew like them. That's what's happening. How come, he asked. I'll tell you a story and we'll finish with that. 
You know, after the Americans and the Russians liberates the camps, so a few Jews survived in the camps, not a lot. So they brought cases of food, some bread, you know, tuna, whatever they put over there. And they saw the Jews, basically the way they look is like this tripod. That's how skinny they were. That's how people are. Like you look at, basically there was no, nothing, just bones. Just bones. That's how it was. The bones came up from here, there. It's horrible. Look like a skeleton. So, there was one American soldier, Jew, from, from Manhattan. His name was Mr. Winiger. Winiger, Winiger. That was his last name. So under his helmet, he has a yarmulke, and it sits inside his uniform. And he saw one Jewish kid, and he was trying to have a conversation with him, but he didn't know he's a Jew, because he has his helmet. So the kid was trying to avoid him. So the kid started to walk, he walks after him. The kid started to run, he runs after the kid. You see, the kid is running to some forest. So he follow him, he said, don't run, I'm also a Jew. See, he took out his tzitzit, but the kid was busy on one thing. He got to a tree and he started to dig in the ground. He's digging, digging, digging. So he saw after a few minutes, he took out some nice, beautiful silver menorah, handmade, an art piece, menorah of Hanukkah. So he took it out, he cleans the sand, and he's crying, the boy. So he came to him and said, relax, I'm also a Jew. So he said, well, what is this? He said, that's the only thing I left for my family. The Nazi came, they took my family, they took my father, and then probably they, later they took my mother. I don't know what's happened with them. <clears throat> when they separated us, and that's what I have left. So he said to him, what are you planning to do now? He said, where can I go? They took away our homes. We have nowhere to go. I don't know what to do. So he asked him, do you want to come with me to America? I'll adopt you. I'll take you with me, I'll put you in yeshiva, in Manhattan. So he said, of course, well, would you do it for me? He said, yes. So he took him. He brought him to Manhattan. So, you know, he cleaned the menorah, he puts it by the window. Okay. Then a few months later, Hanukkah came. And they lit candles in this menorah. But before Hanukkah came, one of Winiger's friends is working in a museum of art in Manhattan. He came one time to visit. He looked at the menorah, he almost fainted. He told, him, he told Winiger, where did you get this menorah from? He told him, it's not me, it belongs to the boy I brought. He, he said to him, you don't understand, there's only four like this in the whole world. It's world fortune. So it's 200 years old, menorah by this designer, you know. So he told him, he said, well, would he sell it to the museum? So I speak to him. So he called the boy. He offered him, we're talking now more than 60 years ago, $50,000 check. It's probably more than half a million dollars today, 60 years ago. $50 million, you can buy a few houses back then. So the boy said, no, no, it's the only memory I have for my mother and my, my family. I don't want to sell it. The boy, bar mitzvah boy. He had an opportunity right away to become a millionaire. In this age, with no, without parents, without anyone, who would not do it? He said, no, no, it's my only memory from my family, I don't sell it. <laughs> I told him, if you change your mind, I have a check ready for you. Just stay it and, you, and we'll give you the money. So a few months later, Hanukkah arrived. And they light candles in a menorah. And uh, in the third day of Hanukkah, somebody knocks on the door. Winiger opens the door, you see Yiddish mommy like this, she comes, she says, excuse me sir, I just walked by, I looked at your menorah, it's an amazing menorah, do you mind if I look at that from close? They say, okay. So you see, she comes, she's holding it, she's crying, where did you get this menorah? I had the same thing like this in Europe, she's crying, crying. So he told her, you know, I have a boy, it's not... As they speak, the boy came out from the room, he looked at the woman, he screamed, Mommy! He was sure she's dead already. So he got his mother back. 
what are we learning from this story? Now I'll tell you another short story and we'll put both of them together for us to get inspired together. One Rosh Yeshiva from Yerushalayim has an American boy learning by him. The American boy is the son of a very, very wealthy Jew here in New York. This wealthy Jew is a, no, a well-known Baal Tzedakah. He gives lots of donations to yeshivot. So the Rosh Yeshiva from Israel is every year sending a letter to the father of this boy. Please support our yeshiva. You're helping many yeshivot. Your son is learning here. Help us. No response. In the meantime, the wife of this Rosh Yeshiva, she keeps saying to him, I don't understand what kind of fool my husband is. Why can't you not go on first class or business class? You're going from Israel every three, four weeks. You go to America, you raise money for the yeshiva. It's Kvoda Torah. It's the respect of the Torah. You want to sit like a sardine, fine, but what about the Torah? You know, you and your frack, you sit like this, like uh, just an ordinary Jew. We have to sit in a business class. So he said to her, you know, people donating money for the Torah, for the yeshiva, I hate to burn four, five thousand dollars on a ticket just because the chair is a little bit more comfortable. No, yes, no. In the meantime, he doesn't listen to his genius wife. So what did he, she said to him, okay, at least try to get an update. You're flying so much, maybe it'll give you for free. So he come to Elal. He said, you know, I've been flying with you so many times. Maybe you give me a better seat in, you know, in business class. So they check. So they say, oh, you're right. You're really a good customer. Okay, we have a chair for you, business class, free. They give him business class. A few weeks later, he fly again. Same story. Well, maybe you have business class. Yes, we have. Give him business class. Fair time. He got used to it already. So he come. So maybe you have business class. He's already sure. Yes, sir. She said, I'm very sorry, sir. Today the flight is overbooked. We cannot give you this, this business class. So he said, come on. How can you do it? I fly every three weeks. She said, I'm very sorry. Why do you expect me to get somebody out of business class and give you his chair? Call your supervisor. <laughs> supervisor, come. Yes, what can you do? Check. What? She doesn't want to give. Sir, it's, uh, there's not even one seat. Call here, call there. 45 minutes, arguments, no business class. No. How they say in the Megillah, <laughs> He came out very upset. He gets on the plane, wow, going back to economy. So he's going for business class. One American Jew got up, Rabbi, looks at him, never saw him before. Nice to meet you, Rabbi. I am Mr. Let's call him Mr. Moskowitz, just for the story. I am Mr. Moskowitz. You the son of Moskowitz in my class, in my yeshiva? Yes. So the wealthy guy said to him, I know what you're thinking. You've been sending me letters to send you donations, but I promise you that from your first letter, right away I cut a check, $10,000 was ready to be mailed to you. But as it was on my desk, one Rosh Yeshiva from Israel walked into my office and he saw the check made out to your Yeshiva and he told me, I don't understand what kind of fool you are giving money to rabbis that fly first class. Don't you care that your money will go to real Torah instead of this nonsense? So I asked him, what do you mean first class? He said, yes, in my own eyes I saw this Rosh Yeshiva flying business, business class, not once, twice. Twice, I got on a plane, I see him sitting like a Saudi sheikh. So, right away I, I ripped the check. But now, he said, in my own eyes I see you walking into economy, hold on one minute. Take out this checkbook. Six years back, $10,000, $60,000 check. Here, that's for all the last six years, retroactive. Oh, thank you. Ah. <laughs> he came to collect $20,000, <laughs> got on a plane, already 60 in his pocket. Plus what he gives him until today. The story probably continued. Could have been, who knows, maybe a few hundred thousand by now. So that's it, that's the two stories. What are we learning from here? Everything we have in life have a tag price. 
price tag. Not always we see it. Sometimes you see the price, so you know, do I want to pay it, yes or no? But what happens when there is no price tag? Does that mean that you got away with the price? No, the credit card bill will get to you in the end of the month. You see the bill. When the bill arrives, your smile gets wiped out. <laughs> Eating, enjoying, using this whatever uh, 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 trade meal. Running all day. What a beautiful machine. Oh, $1,200. $1,200? Right away, you don't want to look at that. <laughs> You went to a restaurant, you didn't know the price. You're embarrassed. You went on a date, you tried to impress the girl. So they're going to ask how much this steak is. You didn't know it's a $180 piece. <laughs> so, ah, wow, beautiful. Usually, this fancy restaurant, you need a magnifying glass to see the steak. <laughs> you go to the, to the simple restaurant, they give you tons of food, $20. Go to this, so, one guy took me to this steakhouse in Manhattan, you know, this glad kosher place. The steak was so little, say to him, this guy paid $80 for two bites and the, the meal is over. I went home to eat. <laughs> <laughs> so, but good thing they put two little pieces of carrots next to it and a flower, you know. <laughs> so anyway, there's a price. You're about to eat the steak. If they hand you the bill as you're attacking your steak and you see $180, it tastes like sand. Why? Because you saw the price. This vinegar had an opportunity to make fortune. And he would sell the menorah. What would be the price tag? Never see his mother for the rest of his life. Hashem put him in a test. What do you prefer? Money? Or you prefer to trust me? Or you give respect to your parents. What do you prefer? And he prefer the right thing. 99% of the people would not think twice. Give me the money, take the menorah, goodbye. He did what he needs to do. Hashem paid him big time. This rabbi was about to get again business class. He would never know in his entire life how much it cost him that business class. Never know. He would think, wow, how lucky I am. Again, instead of $4,000, I got away with $1,200 ticket. So he's thinking in his mind, I just have $3,000. He wouldn't know he lost two, dollars $300,000 because of this business class. The 10 hours he sat in a comfortable chair cost $300,000. If you ask him in advance, would you pay $300,000 in a business class? What would he say? You crazy? But that's us. When we run after all these jewelry, gold, vacations, this, that, there's no rest. We're very hungry. Everything has a price tag. It's not for free. The, the immediate price tag is that we are going far away from Hashem. That's the biggest tragedy. Because you cannot fall in love with this and Hashem at the same time. No, it's just not working. Either you pat bamelach tochal, and all these things that the Mishnah says, or you live in a museum and you have 15 servants and you sleep on a gold bed and you have a jet. No, go and become a Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. It's not exactly going together. It's not a sin to be wealthy. Again, it's not a sin to have a big house. It's not a problem to even have an assistant, one or two or five. No problem. Remember, it's a problem to get addicted to this life. That's one of the main reasons why we look the way we are. And nobody dares to say the truth anywhere you go. Nobody speaks about Gehenom. Nobody speaks about Michal El Shabbos that is 100% a goy. Nobody say to the fancy ladies of Flatbush that they walk in the street and they're not tzanua according to the halacha. Almost none of them. Nobody. Nobody speak about the weeks that they too long, if it's allowed. Many rabbis say it's not allowed to begin with. Those who allow it, you have to go according to them, you count on them, no problem. They're allowed, but how? For sure they don't allow the ones that women wear here. Nobody talks, nobody cares. It becomes a habit. Nobody talks about the level of the kashruyot here, that half of them is complete taref, cannot count on it. Some of these restaurants cook on Shabbat, an hour before Shabbat, 
business, lots of tricks here. Some of the meats, like it happened in Muncie, 10 years people were getting chickens, taref completely. Nobody thought one time to come and check. Hundreds of people every day eat taref for 10 years. From a person who blow the shofar in Rosh Hashanah and decide which kids will get into the yeshiva and who's not. Sitting on a committee. He decide which kid will become from or which kid will go to lose his neshama. He lands in a Torah, he blows the shofar, and he feed the entire town with chickens that are not even shechita, nevelot. You understand what's happening today? And the question is, do we want to stay like this and then get the punch in the end when we come in front of Hashem? Or we want to wake up today? If we want to wake up today, allow me to give you a great advice. If you want to go to lectures of pleasant rabbis who speak beautiful stories, but you leave the lecture with no guilty feelings, you are a million times wasting your time. Mamash pure waste of time. Those lectures will not get you anywhere. The opposite, they'll keep you the way you are and they numb you. And they keep you the same way until the day you leave this world. Don't look for these kinds of lectures. Waste of time. Find a strong influential speaker, I don't know, I don't know all the speakers here, I know there's hundreds of speakers I'm sure you can find, that speaks hard, speak to the face, speak the truth, not embarrassed, and not, is not looking for your donation and, your, and popularity. Not, 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 not the point to tell you the truth in your face. This is wrong, this is wrong, this is, you have to wake up, don't do this, don't do that. That's what you have to. The Mishnah say, the, the Gemara says, the Gemara say, don't love the ones who compliment you and give you all kinds of, uh, of compliments and, uh, and, and yeshar koach. They're not going to get you anywhere. Look for someone who will smack you and wake you up. Wake up, my wife. Wake up, my sister. Wake up. Look how you dress. Look how you behave. Look how you walk. Look how you talk. Look at your nails. Look at your lipstick. Look at your, all this perfume that you go everywhere. Look at the hirurim you're causing hundreds of men every day on the street. Look how you embarrass your children. Look how you're affecting the house. Look how you're wounding Parnassah. Look how you take away all the blessing from your house. Look how Hashem cannot look at you the way you look. You come, you read Tehillim, sometimes you even cry. You need, you have a problem. Hashem cannot listen to you the way you dress. Look about lack of emuna, No emuna, All the time fighting, battling this. What about emuna in Hashem? Everyone is worried. If you're going to learn, how are we going to live? You have to work extra hours. I'm not satisfied with Rabbi. My husband wants to learn an extra hour every day, but we have a lot of bills. Nobody has emuna. No emuna. I'm religious. How can you be religious if there's no emuna in Hashem? We're basically done here. Now I'm sure you have some questions. If you have questions... We'll keep it short, don't worry. <laughs> One person told me, I have lots of questions, but I'm afraid you're going to speak another hour. So I'll email them to you. <laughs> no, it's okay. We'd rather answer your questions right now, because maybe all these things I talked about, you already know. Yes? Are righteous people who get cancer also? Are righteous other people? How do you know who's righteous, who's not? I feel that I'm not. Do you know one person in the world we can know 100% he's righteous besides Rav Steinman? and Rav Kanievsky and Rav Ovadia and a few others. How many people we can really sign for sure that they're 100% tzaddikim? 100? 300? No, so the rest we don't know. Plus, I didn't say that only the wicked people get cancer. There's also other reasons. Sometimes a person has to die 50. To begin with, he doesn't have to have long life, or 20. Sometimes kids, three, four years, and they leave the world. I only spoke, I highlighted... One issue, but doesn't mean that's the only reason for that, a lack of modesty on being wicked. There's other reasons. A person can get killed by a car. By a, it can be many things. But that's the main reason. The main problem is the way we look and the way we behave. Any questions? Huh? Your audience is very polite. Not one attack. Nobody got angry at me today. How can it be? Uh, you're going to hear about it. Ah, so over here, it's with, uh, usually with other places, it's right in my face. Okay, before you attack, indirectly, I just want to warn you about one thing. Don't worry. <laughs> Everything I said, 
Did I say one thing that it's on my opinion, or everything I say I read to you, or I told you directly from the Torah, from the Gemara? Modesty, I invented the laws of modesty, no. The laws of Shabbat, did I invent the law that Mechal el Shabbos is 100% like a goy? It's seven times in Shulchan Aruch. Seven times, not one time. Did I say it about being in a court, in a secular court? That's a law. It's, it's um, Din Moser. Did I speak, did I say a different statistic than what it is about the breast cancer and about the thing? This is exactly the statistic. So if you want to complain, be brave. Complain to Hashem directly. Why to go to Shmuel to come to me to come to Hashem? Just go out of here, pick up your head to the sky, and go like this. Take a rock, throw it at Hashem, and tell him it's all your fault. Why did you bring me here? Or why did you bring me to this lecture? <laughs> I can answer you if you don't want to ask, if you want to wait for Hashem to answer, it may take some time. But I can answer you right now that the fact you got here tonight, for me it's very clear, that Hashem really loves you. And He wanted you to hear it. <coughs> but the most important thing, that He wants you to do something about what you heard, not to go back to your normal lifestyle tomorrow like nothing happened. That's the real test. Tonight already. Some adjustments. Some changes right away in the way I pray, in the way I dress, in the way I talk, in the way I conduct business, in my Shabbos, in my emuna in certain things that I do wrong, in my integrity, in my honesty, in my Lashonara, in the level of learning, how much I'm going to learn, and all the things we discussed and things that we did not discuss. That's, what, that's the test of a Jew, to hear and to do. La'asotam. Hayom la'asotam u'machar lekabel scharam. More questions before we're done? That's it. Everything good? Does anybody have a question that they don't want to say to us? <laughs> Even about what we didn't speak. Any question? Children, marriage, children, business, marriage, Shabbos, Mashiach. No? Anything? All right. Yeah, okay, yes. I don't know. When was Rav Pham born? Rav wasn't born in America. But one, I gotta tell you, <laughs> it bothered you, huh? No, but I gotta tell you. My father was, was like a diehard cousin. No, no. I feel, I feel like it's wrong. I told you Ma- in America not to say that. One time I was in uh, Milwaukee and I was supposed to fly back to New York. And my plane landed, emergency landing in Cleveland. And we got stuck there in a snowstorm for seven hours. And I see among thousands of Goim, I saw one holy man. He does not remove his, book from the, his face from the book for hours. I, then I saw another Litvish Jew with a black hat and a little boy with a yarmulke, a redhead boy, and a rabbit said, I figured that's a rabbi, I didn't know who he is. So I asked the man, who is this? He told me, you don't know who it is. Gdol Ador of America. The biggest rabbi in America, Rav Pam. And now I'm having, I have to get on a plane with about 130, 140 people. We are the only Jews over there. I say to Hashem, Hashem, if you have a little love for me, please make my seat next to him, <laughs> next to the rabbi. We get on a plane. It's a whole story. I don't want to give you the whole story, but I lost my ticket, my boarding pass. I'm looking for my boarding I don't. I go back to the desk. She t- I say, oh, well, I don't know where my boarding pass is. Mean, you have a problem. You cannot get on a plane. I'm starting to argue with her. Then he called me up. He said, young man, we're talking more than 15 years ago. Young man, he says, come here. Don't worry. <laughs> you get home on time. Just to finish this sentence, one black woman from the other side of the terminal. I don't know how my boarding pass got there. She picked it up from the phone. Anyone lost his boarding pass? She screamed. <laughs> so I run, I get the ticket. Now I'm standing on line. I wanna, he has a little suitcase. I said, Rabbi, can I hold the suitcase for you? He didn't want He was holding the suitcase. We're going on a plane, my chair right next to him. Two hours we're on the plane. I'm dying for a a second to ask him for a bracha. But I'm embarrassed to to bother him. His face is in a book like this. Doesn't move left, right. The world doesn't exist. Mama, holy. I say to my, now this is a horrible fly. Remember, it's a snowstorm. The plane is moving, shaking. People are flying. (laughs) Doesn't move like this. Just when the plane landed, he wanted to pick up his suitcase. I jumped like a soldier. I took the suitcase. I gave it to him. So, Rabbi, here, maybe you give me a bracha. 
So he told me, you're soon bringing us good news. Right after that, I had a baby boy, my first boy. Then, a few months later, I come home. I used to live in Lower East Side, in Manhattan. I come home, I look at my... Purim, was Purim. I come home, I see on my door, Mishloach Manot, in a little bag. I open the bag, I take out a card, I say, Rebitzen and Rabbi Pam. <laughs> I didn't even tell him who I am, what I am, nothing. I just told him I live in Lower East Side. And I told him my last name, that's it. Two things he knew about me. Then, one person who lives in my building learned with his grandson, Hevruta. Look how a mind of a, of a holy man thinks. He said, do you know one person in the Lower East Side by this name? He said, yeah, I learned Gemara with him. He said, tell him, here, this is for him. He gave me Mishlach Manot. He put some chickpeas inside, an orange, and some few other things. I think it was the happiest day of my life. <laughs> of, um, but he wasn't born in America. But we have to double check. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much again. Good night.